I do. And I think what it comes down to is this weird cocktail. It's that white people, really educated white people, especially really enjoy the idea of showing that they're not racists. That's actually a victory in itself. I mean, think about how Archie Bunker would have felt about this sort of thing. But the 70s in particular were when the idea was not only that you get rid of segregation, but that you're not supposed to be prejudiced, as people used to say. You're not supposed to be a bigot. And it worked. And I think many white people are very proud of themselves for that. And I think that it's slowly transmogrified into a kind of replacement for Protestantism as it eclipses, where your grace is that you are not a racist. So you have white people who are ready to demonstrate this at the same time as you have black people who, after the civil rights revolution, are still haunted by insecurity because of how black America was treated for almost 400 years. And if you are a human being seeking a sense of purpose and security and well-being and comfort, you might choose the victimization complex. Any human being can do this. But if you're a Black person, a particular way to do it is to exaggerate about racism and to found your sense of significance on being a victim of something now referred to abstractly as systemic racism, et cetera. And so there are many Black people who enjoy the condescension that I think comes from a lot of whites in treating us as these delicate creatures. And so it becomes a kind of dance. Shelby Steele wrote about this better than I can ever say it way back in the early 90s. I read him at that time and I thought, this guy gets it. And he clearly isn't crazy either. And so that's what it is. And so we're not allowed to admit how much better things have gotten. There's a certain kind of person and you know they, they are of all colors, where if you point to the good news, they don't want to accept it. It's unpleasant for them to hear how much better things have gotten. And they're, they're thinking that their job as moral actors is to find evidence to go against it. And that's a weird thing. I think that's probably unprecedented in human history for a group of people to not want to admit that things are better. We live in strange times, but that's what happened in the late 20th century in the United States. You know, that uh, the invocation of religion or a religious impulse to some of this informs your controlling metaphor of the, the book project on, on Substack, The Elect. Can you, uh, for those of us who are not uh, versed in Protestant theology uh, or <laughs> Calvinism, I guess, could you talk a little bit about what the elect means and why you are sure. choosing that term to talk about people who are kind of super woke, super politically correct, mm -hmm. and um, you know, uh, reticent to acknowledge any kind of progress. Yeah, the elect, and I get that term from Joseph Bottom. It's not, it's not mine. The elect is my term for not just woke people. You know, I might surprise some people lately, but I consider myself pretty woke. It's woke people who are mean. It's the nasty woke people. It's the nastiness that we've seen, especially since last summer during our so-called racial reckoning. And what I mean by the elect is they're people who seem to think of their purpose as being to demonstrate that they're not racist and to police the rest of us for racism and to defenestrate and shun people who they deem to be not anti-racist enough. And so their idea is that they're doing something that's maximally good for humankind. The idea is that to battle power differentials, and especially ones about race, is the paramount goal of the concerned human being. Everything is supposed to be centered on that. And this is important. All people won't understand it, but this is so important that it's okay to hurt people and it's okay to do things that you wouldn't urge your own children to do in the name of this larger good. And so although the people don't think about it, all of this is very, very cultural revolution, very Stalin. It's frankly, metaphorically, it's Hitler in many ways. But as with all of those people, the elect today, the woke people who are okay with being mean in the name of wokeness, they think of themselves as having come to the ultimate answer. And the parallels with religion, especially evangelical religion, are almost uncanny, especially given that most of these people kind of look askance at Christianity in its more extreme forms. But white privilege is original sin. The idea is that if you're white, you're privileged, and that will never change. Even if you're poor, no matter what you do, that's original sin. The idea that we're waiting for America to come to terms with racism, that has no meaning. What, what are the terms? What, what would that be? You say it and you nod, 
in the same way as if somebody goes like this and puts does that circular, you nod because somehow that means yes. Well, come to terms with race. That doesn't mean anything. What it is, is it's the rapture. It's that business of the end of days and judgment day. The reason that if a person says something that isn't sufficiently anti-racist, they have to be chased out of the room or their job is because it's about heresy. The idea is we can't even stand to have Andrew Sullivan in our midst in a Zoom call. You know, Andrew Sullivan has to resign. And remember, the idea was that they didn't want him around when nobody was around each other because it was in the middle of the pandemic. That's because they think of him. They thought of him at New York Magazine as a heretic. They wouldn't use those words. The parallels just go on and on. And so you have a clergy. You have writers who are looked to to say things over and over again, many of which are very hard to square with reality. But frankly, people like ta Coates and now Robin DiAngelo and Ibram X. Kendi, they are priests of this religion. They don't think of themselves that way. They're certainly not saying it. But the way their writings are received is not as informational tracts, but as scriptural Council. So it's a rather alarming movement because you can't reason with people who are working from religion rather than logic. And that's not to say that religion is idiocy in itself, right. but a part of religion is that you sequester a part of your brain away from logic that goes from A to B to C. You have to suspend your disbelief. And the new wokeness, wokeness that's mean, electism, as I'm calling it, is religious in that way. And the people in question can't be reached. And that's scary, given how much power they're beginning to amass. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that power. Um, you know, what what is the power? Uh, uh, you know, critics of of anti anti racism or anti wokeness. Um, you know, we'll say, you know, so a couple of people lose their jobs, um, you know, rightly or wrongly, or they or they were racist. You know, uh, uh, Donald McNeil at the New York Times, an old reporter who used the N word, uh, you know, uh, trying In to reference. clarify a statement right. on a class trip in Peru for high school students. So it's already, I'm like, wow, this is taking place in a Philip K. Dick universe and an alternate yeah. reality. But, you know, he got cashiered for that. But you know what? He deserved to go. And it's not, you know, is that too high a price to pay for a kind of cleansing mural, uh, moral purity? Um, you know, what, what are the consequences of this kind of electism? Yeah, the problem is that um, it's not just a few things. That's what a lot of people were saying, say, in July, August. But it's been a while. These Don McNeil stories are now legion. And the idea that he deserved to lose this job is not something that a critical mass of people would agree with. It's the, the elect who think that he should lose his job. And what's going on is that the elect get their way because we're all so deeply afraid of being called racist. It's a reign of terror. The reason that a person can get fired for some minor transgression like that, that nobody would ever have blinked at or would have given him a smack on the hand about just 10 minutes ago, is because nobody wants to be called a racist on social media by these people. If there was no Twitter, there'd be no elect. Part of this is technology. You don't want to be called elect on, you don't want to be called racist on Twitter. It used to be that maybe they would call you a racist in a letter to the editor, but that didn't have the power that Twitter has. And so the problem is that this fear means that people lose their jobs for no moral reason. It means that educational institutions are being turned upside down into these anti-racism academies that don't give people a real education and excommunicate anybody who questions it. That's a serious problem right there. So some people will say, does this really matter? A few reporters lose their job, whatever. Some schools are changing. That's not a question that anybody concerned with the heart of a society would ask. Yes, this is a this is a real problem. It's vastly transforming our whole intellectual, moral, and even artistic culture. And what bothers me so much about it is that it's mendacious. It's all about fear. It's not that these people are convincing most of society of these very narrow, extremist, and self-indulgent views that this hyper wokeism has. It's that everybody's just afraid of them. And I think it's time that we stop being so afraid. Who is driving this? And, uh, you know, as with most uh, kind of vague social forces, it's not, you know, there isn't somebody cracking the whip, uh, you know, in the rider's seat or something in the driver's seat. But it, you know, who who is driving this? Is it a series of black elites? Is it white elites? Is it some mix? At one point you uh, invoke at, at your Substack 
the phrase, and I'm going to butcher it because I cannot pronounce words very well, but Ken D'Angelo, <laughs> Ken D'Angelonianism, yeah. which is a portmanteau of uh, uh, Ibram Kendi and Robin D'Angelo, mm -hmm. a black, you know, a, a, a black scholar and a white scholar. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what, who, who's, who's, who's doing this? Is it white elites? Is it black elites? Is it just elites? What's going on? It's, it's them. And so part of the idea of Ken D'Angelonianism is that it is that white person and that black person. I hate to say this, but the elect starts with black people. It's a way of thinking about race that acquired a certain hold on especially academics, some artists, and a lot of media people. After about 1966, this is when segregation, like outright obvious bigotry and, you know, de and, um, and disfranchisement, that's over. And so you have to have a whole new kind of conversation about what the problems are. And frankly, it's then that a certain kind of black person devotes themselves to exaggerating, pretending that nothing really changed, pretending that black people are more powerless than they are. That used to be a type. And if you were who, white, who, it was easy who's to think, an early who's who's an early incarnation that starts with Stokely Carmichael. That starts mm -hmm. with the people yelling black power and not really being quite sure what it even meant. And a lot of people look back on that era. And I think partly because of the fashions and partly mm -hmm. because the music was good. They think that that was somehow significant, that that was special. But you have to ask, what has black radicalism done to help black America overall? other than be kind of a fashion statement, other than lend some inspiring speeches. You know, Huey Newton was very interesting. Stokely Carmichael was very interesting. Amiri Baraka was very interesting. But Black America's victories have been in spite of them, not because of anything that they did. Nevertheless, you had that kind of person. And what this means is that the Ibram Kendi type has been with us for about 50 years, but it used to be that he was somebody who, you know, got a doctorate from somewhere and wrote some books and there you went. But now we have the D'Angelo type and she's a, she's not as young as a lot of the whites who are doing this. Electness among white people tilts young, although there are people who are her age and older who have always thought this way, who now have an influence that they didn't have before. And so white fragility. A year ago, I'd heard of it. I wasn't going to read it. And I don't think I was alone in that. That changed immediately because of this racial reckoning. And so it's a, it's a collaboration, unwittingly, between a certain kind of Black radical who I, with all due understanding, think had more to do with, with posturing than actually creating change in America as we know it. That's not, they didn't do it on purpose, but I don't see them as as important as some historians do. But then you have a certain kind of white fellow traveler. That cocktail, it's another one of these cocktails, mm -hmm. that is what's driving all of this. Whites who have founded their sense of purpose on showing that they're not racist and teaching other people not to. And Black people who, because it can be hard to find your comfort zone and to have a sense of purpose for any human being, there's a kind of Black person who lives to paint white people as the enemy because therefore you are a noble victim. The noble victim complex, that's homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. Those together, when you have black people with that problem and white people with that problem, is the elect. And boy, can that be powerful because those people like to call other people racists. And once there's social media, that can be really, really scary unless you're somebody who has the disease of not minding being despised. That's not most people.